Take Time. I am your host, Patrick Marlette, and welcome to our part two video on the Seiko Cocktail Time. Now, if you haven't had a moment to watch our part one video of the Seiko Cocktail Time, I will encourage you to click over to that first. In part one, we do an unboxing, a first impression, and of course, I take any inquiries there and answer them at the end of this video here. And there was really only one huge looming question on the minds of all of the viewers, and I'm going to answer that a little bit later, but I'm probably going to touch on it throughout the video today. But as you guys know, with all of my in-depth reviews, I like to start with the bad and then move on to the good before I finally get to my verdict. So let's start there. So in front of me today, I am holding the Seiko SSA 345J. So this is the Japanese version of the Cocktail Time and what they like to call the Espresso Martini Coloration. And right off the bat, one of the first things I noticed in the unboxing was that it had very little hint of brown in the dial construction. And as this was called the Espresso Martini, you kind of expected it to have more of a brown tint. Well, I'm happy to report that even right now, you can see just a little bit more of that brown tint, and it's highlighted by this chocolate brown strap I'm wearing. Initially, this watch came with a black strap, which I have off to the side, but the brown strap brings out more of that dial detail, and I have to say that in the flesh and out in natural light, not studio lights like we have here, uh, the brown is more apparent, and I have some images I'll throw up so you guys can see that as well. But Accenting the dial with a brown leather strap has really brought it out just a little bit more, but still I'll say that the espresso martini coloration is more of a mute gray to light gray in tone. And that is either a good or a bad note for you. I understand that a lot of you, um, when you look at the stock photography for this watch, you expect a, you know, a, more of a brown accent color to the dial. So. Uh, maybe that's just my version, maybe there's a variance between different uh, 345s, but uh, mine came with a lighter brown uh, undertone, so that's just how it is. Now the next bad note I'd like to mention, and I'm going to have to move the handset to illustrate what that is here, is the power reserve indicator hand. Actually, the handset in general really bothers me about this watch. I love the dial face, I love the hour markings, but the Dauphine hands they chose to utilize on this watch, I've noticed that all of the models in the Presage cocktail line have the same sort of handset, that being half polished, half frosted, and you can see what I mean here. The left side of the hour and minute hand is frosted, while the right side is polished, and that is if you looked at this watch with those two hands facing the 12 o'clock position. And as I alluded to a moment ago, that power reserve hand, uh, some people have quoted that it's supposed to look like a martini glass, uh, albeit an upside down martini glass. I don't like the sparkly, sharpy, silver coloration of that hand. I really don't like how that looks at all. It cheapens the look of the watch. And the other note I was making about those Dauphine hands, it just cheapens the look of the watch. I really wish that they went with a handset that was completely high polished to match the hour markers around the dial face. I would have much preferred that. I mean, this thing is high polished everywhere. I mean, sides, back, everywhere. You know, just follow the theme that you've already established for yourself and give me high polished hands instead because I think they would have looked a whole lot better. And when you punctuate certain elements with that frosted look, uh, that you can see on the handset, like, you know, the Seiko logo, which is also enlarged on this dial, I'll get back to that later, and the frosted date hand. Those things stick out just a little bit more, but you muddy the overall appearance of the watch when you add that element to the handset. It would have looked much better high polished. And the last thing I want to mention about that power reserve hand, I, I don't like it whatsoever. It's just, why not follow the excellent seconds hand that you've made for this watch and other uh, Saarb models, and this is not a Saarb watch, but the original was, but that, that second hand, that needle and eye hole is just beautiful. You know, I would have loved to see that eye hole mimicked on the power reserve, maybe had another high polished element there, instead of going with that Sharpie silver metallic look. It just does not look that appealing on the dial, and again, it cheapens the overall look. And not that this watch is overly expensive, I think, to your average consumer, this watch is in a really decent price range if you're looking for a dress watch. Very competitively priced, 
it's around the $350 to $400 region. Uh, for a four-arm movement, that's sort of the ballpark, but I, I kind of expected the detailing to be a little bit better with those minor notes. And in regards to the detailing, I do have a few more qualms. The hour markings themselves, at least on my version of the watch, I don't know if you can pick it up on the camera here, but there are little particles of dust or some sort of debris lining pretty much all of the 12 hour markings around the dial. Come on, like what is that? Were, were these stored in a dusty box before set onto these watches and the production line? I, I don't know why my version has these little dust particles on them, but they do. And that might not be a fault uh, of Seiko's factory, it might be an issue with where these were stored uh, before they went out for shipment. Um, but there, there was a level of quality control that was missed here. Um, and I, I hope you can see what I'm talking about. It's even hard for me to tell, but in person, there are little dust particles and bits of debris on all of those hour markings, and it throws off the look a little bit because you do notice it. Another bad note I would like to mention is the lugs on this watch. They seem to be dwarfed by the overall scale of this watch, and there are issues with the scale of this watch just in general, but these lugs are just a little too short for me. I mean, I would have preferred that the watch be cut down in scale just a little bit more, maybe not 40.5, but maybe 38.5, maybe 39 millimeters in width across this uh, round frame here, so that you had slightly more elongated lugs, because as it stands now, they're, they're very minuscule and they don't, they don't look as nice on the wrist as I've seen other dress watches with longer uh, lugs, and I'll cite my King Seiko here. Those have very prominent lugs, and that, that detail is something that was overlooked here. I do like a case that looks complete in its entirety, and something about these lugs, the diminutive frame of these lugs, is just not appealing to the eyes. And that's just me, but the way it wears on the wrist, they kind of vanish, and it's, I don't know, the, the dial is the highlight of this watch, so I suppose that's why these lugs are so small. And they don't look good on camera, but they do wear that way. But again, it, it does help to accentuate the dial, so it is a good and a bad point. And one of the final bad notes I'd like to mention is the literature on the dial, and this is sort of a viewer-related complaint, but also uh, a minor one on my part. I do like how the text for Presage and Automatic were done, and I do love the Frosted Applied logo over at the 12 o'clock. It is rather large, and everything about this watch reads large, so maybe a smaller Seiko logo would have been uh, better suited for this, but uh, by and large, I find that the literature on the dial works very well. Another viewer-related complaint, and I'll touch on that here, is the power reserve. I noted some people said it would have looked better if the power reserved text wasn't there at the 11 o'clock. Um, I actually quite like it. I think that this is one of the better implementations of a power reserve when it comes to a dress watch. I don't like when they have the cutouts, you know, they, they remove a part of the dial to, you know, put in the power reserve, and then you have this sort of awkward one-third of a wheel where your reserve is indicated. I much prefer, like, the very, very faint detailing of the power reserve here, how it doesn't diminish the quality of the dial or take away from it, and it just accentuates the dial by having that, what, what looks almost like a, like a gauge on a car, uh, e being empty, it almost feels like you're looking at um, a car dashboard when you see that. And it's actually very appealing. I know that might not sound appealing, but it's, it's actually a nice element to this watch. Now, I don't have very many more bad notes about this watch. Again, I wish a lot of those frosted elements were just high polished, those being the hour and minute hand. I wish they would have went with a better power reserve indicator hand. The one on here just it just looks so cheap. It doesn't look great for this watch. Again, this is a relatively affordable dress watch when you compare it to other offerings from different brands and even amongst Seiko's offerings. This is an affordable dress watch, so, you know, if one or two elements look cheap, it, it makes sense. But overall, you have a watch that is simply brilliant in person and would have been benefited with just a few aesthetic changes, in my opinion. 
But uh, all in all, I really do like the overall look of this watch. The last thing I want to mention is about the strap itself. You'll notice that this isn't on the stock strap. A quick little shout out to Watch Gecko. If you've never heard of Watch Gecko, they are an online group based out of London who do an amazing array of watch straps. They sent me a little Christmas package, which thank you guys, thank you Tim for sending that my way. And the only reason I'm mentioning it is because this is sort of a miss on Seiko's part. I feel like the chocolate brown or like a dark cognac brown leather option would have been a better choice for this watch. And you can see here, it helps accentuate the brown detailing in the dial. It's just an overall better look to me, especially with this vintage styling with the accent threads near the lugs here. It just looks impeccable. I wore this strap for about three days before switching over because that is when I received the uh, brown leather strap you see in front of me. And I want to talk about this before I I move on to some of the good points, but this black alligator grain strap, it was a good choice, I suppose, and it looked okay on the watch, but um, you know, all in all, I would have preferred a dark brown option for the espresso martini. I think it makes a little bit more sense thematically, but also it just looks better all in all. So eh, yeah, it was a little bit of a miss on Seiko's part. All right, so here we are with the original strap that came with the watch, and I still have the spring bars in it. This is the alligator grain leather strap, and some people said it looked cheap, um, barely nice. And again, mind you, this watch was a little over $300, so I wasn't expecting the world of the leather strap I received, but I do have a few complaints about it, and less to do with the leather, which I find supple and nice on the wrist, but more to do with the clasp, and you can see the first complaint I'm gonna make is right here. Uh, look at the curvature of this clasp. That is an unruly curve, you know. I don't, I don't think it should have been curved this steeply. The idea is it would curve around one of the sides of your wrist. Well, it just doesn't fit that way, or at least it doesn't on my seven and a quarter inch wrist. So what actually happened instead was that this clasp wound up digging into my wrist, the back of my wrist, more often than not, and was very uncomfortable. Um, and that's just how I had to size it, unfortunately. But I went ahead and removed the strap, you know, again, after three days, and replaced it with that one, because it just wore better. Um, I wish they went with a, you know, a, a clasp without as much of a curve, and or just went with a more traditional buckle uh, assembly instead, because this one was just not executed well. I'm not a fan of this clasp. With all the bad notes out of the way, I'd like to move on to some of the good notes and concerns to the cocktail time. And the first thing I would like to mention is time accuracy. Now, so you guys know I use time.gov to gauge the accuracy of my watches. So I will set them the week I receive them. And then with these reviews, at least a week in the life review. And this is actually a little bit over a week. So um, with this little over a week in the life review, I look back at time.gov which is uh, the US standard time, uh, whatever your region is, and use that to gauge the accuracy of my watches. And I actually uh, looked at the accuracy of my watch before adjusting the hands just earlier. As you guys know, I moved those out of the way so I can show you the power reserve hand. This watch has lost about 11 a seconds, 11 a seconds since I timed it initially. So 11 seconds loss after eight days, roughly, is pretty good for a four hour movement. I think it's pretty good. So very, very uh, good props to the calibration of this movement. I'm very happy with that. Losing time is not a huge issue. Again, I wore this thing, it, like, the power never ran out on this watch. It was running the entire time. I think losing 11 seconds is okay. And of course there's gonna be some variance depending on how you stow this thing, if you wear it when you're sleeping, if it's always tightly wound or if it's near the end of its reserve, those things are gonna vary the time accuracy as well. So again, I think 11 seconds is pretty, pretty good. And the next good note I'd like to mention is just how stellar this watch looks. Day to day, I think this watch it's just one of the more fantastic pieces I've ever owned aesthetically. It's just a sheer joy to look at. That sunray finish on the dial with the radial sunburst finish of the sub-dial at 6 o'clock that gauges the date is just stellar. I love the dimensions with the hour markings and that raise date wheel. It is just an aesthetic marvel. It's, it's just absolutely one of the most eye-pleasing watches I've ever owned, and I'm sure that this statement is true for any of the other cocktail times, be it the 
uh, just date version at 3 o'clock or date and power reserve that I'm holding now. Uh, I think the finish and execution of the dial, and of course the case is top notch. Um, mine is just stellar. I mean, I don't think you're going to be disappointed with how this watch looks. I will say that you will likely be most disappointed with the scale. Now I'm going to mention this as part of my good notes. I think that if you have a seven and a quarter inch wrist that this guy is mostly going to fit fairly well for you. I have a seven and a quarter inch wrist and of course I'm going to show you a wrist shot in a moment, but I think for the most part it looks really good. Um, <laughs> there are Christmas fairs up in New York right now because it is the holiday season here. Uh, we're in the middle of December and there's a bunch of different stores selling trinkets and knickknacks and you can find stores that sell large compasses and, uh, you know, dress watches, things of that nature. And I've noticed a similarity between this watch and a lot of those timepieces in that those are very bulky and showy, showy pieces. This is pretty bulky and very much a show piece, but as the name would suggest, it's really meant for cocktail time. You know, a moment to impress someone, a moment to impress yourself. It, it's a very large in scale watch but I don't think it deters from the overall look or feel of this watch. It just has much more presence than your average timepiece. So again, for the most part, I think the overall scale is good on this watch. Again, you know, I'm used to, like many of you I'm sure, I'm very much more used to a smaller fitting dress watch. Would I have preferred a smaller scaled version? Mm, yes, and you know, that's certainly within Seiko's capabilities. You've seen some of the most recent um, videos, I'm likely sure, on YouTube releasing with smaller scale versions of the Seiko Turtle. I mean, they've always gone back and made smaller scale versions of their watches, or at least they have in modern date, you know, with the Baby Tuna and of course like the Mini Turtle I've mentioned. They're starting to do that as a trend, so maybe we'll see that here with the cocktail time. It would be great to get a 38 millimeter version of this watch. I think it would wear a lot more favorably for many more of us consumers. I'd like to state as one of the more positive notes as well that the hacking function and the hand winding function and the crown stem assembly all function very well. Usually in the sub $500 region, you'll get a Seiko watch that performs a little less than par. Uh, this one is definitely par for the course in that regards. I like the forearm movement in this watch. Ugh, the thickness. I wish wasn't so sick with that movement, but that's okay. Another good note I'd like to mention is actually the hard lex on the face and the back of the watch here. I quite like hard lex in my watches. I don't think it's an issue when there is hard lex. And of course, as a Seiko collector, you're very much used to seeing hard lex crystal on your watches. And I think the execution of this boxed crystal on top and the exhibition case back is very nice. You know, Hardlex is a really great crystal. Um, it's their proprietary crystal for most of their watches. That is Seiko. And it's very clear. You know, this doesn't have any sort of anti-reflective coating or anything like that, but it is very easy to see the dial and direct sunlight with this crystal. And it, you know, it, it's great. It just looks great. I love the dome of this crystal. I like how you can see um, all of the dial with how thin the bezel is. I love the high polished elements of this watch. It is again a dress watch so you know you come to expect those high polished elements. If you're concerned about smudges um, you know this is going to pick them up like a magnet but that is just one of the minor issues you're going to have when you wear a polished dress watch. I would only recommend wearing this watch on leather straps. I don't think it would be a good idea to put it on a NATO or on even a Perlon strap. Perlons are uh, very thin woven cloth straps. It is, again, 14.5 millimeters thick, so it is a thicker watch. And it's crazy because, you know, the Seiko Tuna lineup, those watches are in the 14 millimeter region as well. But those get a pass from me because they're, they're tool watches. They're supposed to be a little bit more resilient, a little bit larger. 14.5 is very thick. That is the only measurement in the scale of this watch that I'm not a fan of. You know, it doesn't allow you to use those strap options you might want to wear. Of course, you can throw a pearl on on this, but it will be a lot larger on the wrist. It's gonna have much more presence on the wrist. And maybe that is or isn't a bad thing for you because it is a showy piece. So maybe a little bit more thickness wouldn't kill you, but it would really bother me. So 
I would not recommend that option for you. Stick with leather and don't use rubber. Just stick with a nice leather strap and I think you'll be okay. And of course, I would like to show you a wrist shot of this piece so you get an idea of how it's going to wear on your wrist and the kind of presence I have been alluding to this whole time. So why don't we cut to that next? So here's what the watch is gonna look like for all of your admirers. And this is what it's gonna look like when you go to admire it yourself. Man, as you can tell, again, it is a real stunner. And of course, I have a seven and a quarter inch wrist. If you guys don't know, I think that the overall look and presence of the watch on the wrist is extremely favorable. I think it is a great looking watch, a great feeling watch on the wrist, but the, the thickness again is, is an issue. And that is the biggest viewer related inquiry I received. As a matter of fact, it was one of the only questions I had about this watch was, is it too large? Is this watch too large? I think the modern consumer is going to find this watch well at home with most of their collection. Um, particularly when you look at Seiko's lineup. And Seiko has had historically large watches, let's not be mistaken. I mean, since the 70s, even the late 60s, their watches have been large in scale. Not necessarily their sports watches, um, th those being the divers. The chronographs, yes, certainly were much larger in scale, but it's, it's not an uncommon trend for them. And as of recent date, Seiko has been making a series of dress watches that are much larger in frame. Now, I'm not going to list off all of them, but there are a ton of JDM models that are larger in frame. And it, it seems to be a, a reoccurring trend with the brand and not necessarily one I detest, but not one I'm a personal fan of. So if you guys are asking me personally whether I think this watch is too large, no, I don't think 40.5 is that wide a dimension. I do think 14.5 millimeters thick is extremely thick for a dress watch. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to agree with a dress watch being that thick. I think 13 millimeters might even be pushing it, but all of the dress watches I own are in the 12 millimeter region, and that seems to be a sweet spot. I think most of the people that are gonna to want to wear a watch this stunning um, are going to probably put it under a cuff when they're not admiring it or checking the time on it. And it is a lot a difficult, a lot more difficult rather, putting this under your cuff at this thickness. Now, should this deter you from buying the watch? There are so many positives to this timepiece. I mean, you're getting a very excellent, accurate movement. You are getting a well, well executed power reserve indicator, and you are getting one of the most amazing dial faces on any dress watch on the market whatsoever. And a lot of you guys have pointed out, I believe the model reference is SARY085. Um, that is just mind-blowingly beautiful. Maybe I'll throw an image up on the screen right now, or you guys can look it up yourself, but uh, I'll likely throw up. You're gonna, you, here's the image now. This is what that watch looks like. They're doing so much with the cocktail line. I, I think the fact that they've conceived this years ago and decided to, you know, take it to their mainstream market, like do a bunch of them, you know, blow this collection up was a smart idea because these watches are gorgeous. You know, there are a few minor refinements, again, that they should make with the, whatever the Mark III version is of this watch. You know, to tone down the scale a little bit, particularly the thickness, change up the handset, give me a better power reserve hand, and then I think it might just be perfect. But so far as a second attempt from the brand is concerned, I really think they knocked it out of the park, by and large, with the entire collection. The Cocktail Time series is here to stay. They're absolutely stunning. They're in the right price bracket for most consumers. I've seen people with much higher end collections looking to get them, and I've seen people that are looking to get their first dress watch consider this over something like the Orient Bambino or anything from Citizen's Eco Drive lineup um, because a lot of people lust after mechanical automatic movements. This gives you that flair. It would be cool if they made a hand wind only version of this watch and cut down the scale. I, I, I am a fan of manually wound dress watches. It's very traditional in, in, in that sense, and um, there is intimacy with those kinds of watches. Also, more importantly, again, it's going to cut down the thickness. It would be very cool. That would be a nice future update to the series. But again, I think the cocktail time is pretty spectacular. So in conclusion, the watch, in my opinion, is a success. I think the scale is much larger, at least for the SSA series of watches with the power reserve. The scale is a little bit larger than most would prefer but is passable for most modern consumers. 
I do believe that the other range of watches that are more in line with the Saab 065 um, are going to be better for most individuals. So if you liked the dial arrangements uh, of that set as opposed to this, then I would just recommend getting the date version only. Uh, they are a lot thinner than this model. I, of course, would love to get one in to talk about, but I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. There are a lot of great uh, YouTubers talking about them, though, so you do have them to turn to. Now, expect to see this watch in another video because I do have an interesting timepiece to compare it with coming in. I'm very excited to pit those two against each other, and I, I think it's going to be a very compelling comparison as to which you should get. But I, I think for the most part, I'm very satisfied with this dress piece. Whether it stays in my collection or not is a different story. I've, you know, I've never really been a huge fan of dress watches and I've made room in my collection for one dress watch. No, I'm not considering my Grand Seiko a dress watch. Although it kind of is. It's more of a sports watch. I mean, 200 meters water resistant is pretty ridiculous for a dress watch, I just want to say. But enthusiasts, if you liked this video, I will encourage you to hit that like button. It looks a little something like this. If you found this video informative or entertaining in the least, I'll encourage you to share this with any friends, forums, or groups that are interested in watches. If you watched the part one video and saw the part two and know a friend that also did, uh, maybe share this with them so they can finally get the conclusion of my thoughts on this piece after a week in the life. And if you've been following the channel for a while and have not subscribed, what is going on? I know for a fact when I look at my analytics that there are a good 54% of you that watch each episode that are actually indeed subscribers. And thank you so much for joining the family here. For all of the other 46, 47%, join in guys. We have discussions here on the channel all the time, reviews, interviews, and vlogs to come. Uh, this is a great place for you if you like horology or just like a consumer's approach to viewing horology. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and thank you for the time.